to uh, welcome tonight's speaker. Um, Justin McMahon and I uh, first met in the early 1980s uh, working at a uh, site of Rizala in southeast Turkey. Uh, and this was the time when uh, Prince Charles married Lady Diana and everyone in the village clustered around the battery operated TV to watch the royal family. So, you know, this was really ancient history. <laughs> 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 um, Augusta has, uh, 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 is a university senior lecturer uh, in Near Eastern Archaeology and History at um, the University of Cambridge uh, in England. And uh, her uh, bachelor's degree is from uh, Bryn College, and her PhD is from the University of Chicago, where she worked with Professor McGuire Gibson uh, at uh, Nippur, and has just, um, in the last couple of years, has just recently, uh, published very important contribution to the archaeology of Iraq. And Augusta has uh, worked across the, the Near East, um, in Giza, um, in Yemen, in uh, Turkey, in uh, Syria, and in Iraq. So it's really a, a remarkable range of, um, of uh, fieldwork uh, experience. Uh, she's been, um, I, I guess, sort of stalking uh, Sir Max Malawan in that she's been working at almost all of the major sites that Malawan worked at, uh, at Nineveh. Uh, she was, um, I, I guess, co-directing um, at Chagar Bazaar. And then most recently, she became the, um, the field director for the, uh, the excavations at Tel Brak, which is the subject of, of her talk tonight. And Tel Brak is an extraordinarily important uh, site for the uh, the archaeology of the Near East, and uh, her selection by uh, uh, Professor Joe Notes to be the field director is a real tribute to, uh, to, uh, to her abilities. Um, so uh, we're really delighted to welcome you back to Chicago, and um, uh, the title of her talk is Death in the City, Excavations at Tug Rock. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Augusta McMahon. Uh, I'd just like to add my thank you to all of you for coming out. It's not the most perfect weather that I would have wished. Um, but anyway, um, Tel Brock. Anyway. Um, it's a massive site, um, and as Gil said, one of the key sites for understanding northern Mesopotamia. And there's a, a sequence at Tel Brock which covers everything back from the Neolithic through essentially the Islamic period in various parts of the site. I'll actually be focusing on the late Calcolithic material, which is fourth millennium and early urbanism, and particularly uh, some conflict events that happened at the point when the site was expanding to urban size. Um, trying to just arrange myself a little bit better here. Um, so anyway, massive site, as Gil said, it was first explored by Max Malawan, who was the husband of Agatha Christie, if you don't know him, um, probably know her, and that was back in the 1930s. Then there was a long episode of um, non-excavation, a break of excavation, until the 1970s when David and Joan Oates of the University of Cambridge restarted the excavations. And then from 1994, when the Oateses began to show their age, let's say, they're still, the Joan Oates is still very, very active, but they began handing over parts of the project to different field directors, um, and in fact, the OI's own Helen McDonald and Jeff Emberley, of course, were field directors um, for, um, from, I think, the late 90s through about 2004. Uh, then since 2006, I took over as field director, and my primary focus has been this early urbanization issues, the development of the world's first cities, and particularly the urbanism conflict relationship. Um, hit that. Um, location of the site, and I have a pointer, yes. Um, I'll turn it around the right way, right? Uh, as you can see right there. And it's near two of the tributaries of the Upper Habur River system, which then feed into the Euphrates, which is down here on the floor. <laughs> um, and this is an incredibly agriculturally fertile area. Um, plenty of rainfall most years, and incredibly archaeologically dense. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of sites from Paleolithic through Islamic. And Tel Hamakar, which is another Oriental Institute project, and our very good friends and somewhat distant neighbors, uh, is 
out there from further, further to the east. They have uh, complementary time periods and a complementary settlement pattern. We've, uh, we share a lot of team members and it's a, it's a good collaboration. Um, and Rock is one of the largest sites, which means it is fairly clearly visible on Google imagery if you know where you're looking for. Um, this is actually the center, the central mound. There's a larger outer town outside it that I'll be talking about as well. Um, good, um, oh, um, you can see the, the sort of trenches and holes, the regular holes that you can see in here, essentially are all of the different excavations. Um, this sort of more worn down area is Max Madeline's excavations in the 1930s. The slightly sharper ones right there um, are from the 1980s to 1990s, and this is actually sort of 1990s through 2004. Uh, unfortunately, this image was taken, the, the Google image was taken in 2005, and my excavations don't appear here, but um, more or less in this part up here and then um, off the mound as well. And the site's internal morphology is very, very complex, uh, as befits a complex history of occupation. Um, because there's good agricultural lands, good, good rainfall, there is this long sequence of occupation. But the site changes in size and in shape and in density over time. And what we've ended up with is um, these quite distinctive sub-mounds, which are then cut by further erosion gullies from rainfall and so on. And when you're looking for earlier occupation, as you might guess, it's quite difficult because there's a lot of or later overburden over the top. So in order to look at this late Calcolithic fourth millennium material, we have to sort of burrow in on the sides of some of these erosion gullies, um, like what's going on here. And the mound is actually, the top of the mound is another further many meters above. Um, this should be a topographic plan of the site. And these four areas are primary excavation areas from 2006 through, to, um, through 2008. Um, this shows the entire site. And the central high mound, that part right there, is about 70 hectares in size. Then there is, of course, an outer town, which yep, is about this big, right? And that expands out to about 200, 200 hectares. Um, arguably, this outer town is less densely occupied than the center, and it is much more subject to change over time. It very much looks as if the mounded site center is occupied very much continuously, but the outside sort of expands and contracts. Um, in case anyone's sort of trying to get a picture of how much a hectare is or how much two hect 200 hectares is, the next slide should be tell Brock draped over a uh, Google image of, of Hyde Park, so you can actually see roughly how large the site is. Uh, and it's pretty much 55th Street to the other side of the Midway, and from the hospitals, which are here, to Dorchester Avenue. So you can get a sense of like how much space we're actually dealing with at this point. Um, right. So, anyway. The first part of the project, the first part of what I'll be talking about, is looking at early industrial activities, which, believe me, is more exciting than it sounds. <laughs> right? uh, and early urban economy and how, the in, how industry and, and economic um, activities change as we get more socially complex and, and more densely populated. And the area that we chose for this particular excavation is near the northern entrance into the settlement. Uh, there is actually a modern sort of roadway track where you can see the motorbikes parked. And that is, in fact, that marks an ancient access route into the settlement as well. And within that trench, you can see all that. That's the excavation. There is very much a continuous sequence covering well, patches of the second and third millennium, but then the entire fourth millennium. And we're now down into levels which are very early fourth millennium, very late fifth millennium BC. So right around the 4,200 to about 3,800 BC, roughly. Um, and what we've got in here, there is actually the corner of a very large public building which Jeff Emberling was actually responsible for excavating. And we're now excavating the industrial area which is adjacent to that. Um, and there's an interesting um, just exploration of how these two, these two features interact with each other. 
Now, this is a photo actually taken during excavation. The grassy patch at the back is the location of the public building, and then the industrial area is the part out towards the front, and then I'm standing actually um, in, the, in the site entrance. Now, we've got 22 architectural levels have so far been identified within this area TW sequence. I'm only going to talk about the bottom four, which I'm responsible for, but we have some interesting changes over time, architectural changes and also changes in the material culture as we went. At the bottom, or the bottom of what, what we've reached so far, we are at about 4,200 BC to roughly 4,000 BC we're still significantly above the level of the plain at this point. So there's easily a good 10 to 15 meters of earlier deposit below in this area. So again, back into the fifth millennium, potentially into the sixth millennium, somewhere down there. Um, in these levels that we're at so far, that's 22 and 21, there isn't really very much architecture. The significant features are these big ovens and pottery kilns, um, which themselves are actually quite substantial. They're about one and a half to two meters in diameter. So this is not the kind of thing that we expect to see in sort of domestic houses. These things are, in fact, on a much larger scale. And there's no houses nearby. There's really no, um, well, no domestic kind of refuse, nothing that looks as if people are living there, no houses and so on. There is some architecture that tends to be little sort of wind breaks and very, very ephemeral kind of architecture that, that um, was, was sort of cut down and rebuilt and cut down and rebuilt, very, very young, sort of changing all the time. Um, in the, so that's level 22 right there. In the subsequent level 21, which is only slightly later, roughly, than most of the material culture stays very much the same. More of the same, more ovens, more very ephemeral architecture, enormous pits full of ash. Um, and we can actually see that, that some of the ovens were decommissioned in a way, right, um, used, then they went out of use, and they were actually used for storage materials. Um, in this case, actually, there's a lot of um, grinding stones um, stored in this, in this oven. Um, and so anyway, quite ephemeral oven, um, lots of change or, uh, in, in a rapid, in, in a short amount of time. Um, these two levels, which were relatively ephemeral, were then actually covered over in this next level, level 20, which is right around 4,000 BC, with a much more significant building. Um, still quite irregular, um, but at least it is one single integrated building. It's still not domestic. Um, it's not a house. There are still ovens and pits and piles of ash and large quantities of raw materials of various kinds that I'll show you in a minute that indicate that there was basically industrial activities happening in here. This is also the point at which we know the big public building was, was um, established. And just so you can get a sense of that, this is the, the total plan with public building over on that side. Um, unfortunately, not we, the, it couldn't really actually be entirely excavated. We know that there's at least two rooms. They were very, very clean. And so the precise function of um, this, this building is not really well known, but it has an enormous basalt threshold, huge wide walls, very, very symmetrical, and very much looks like a public administrative structure. Then there's the more irregular industrial building um, on the west, and then the street and the access route is out there. <laughs> right. um, so that's in level 20, and then this was followed by, in this next level, level 19, Again, a gradually more significant, massive looking structure. Now this one looks very, very similar to the public building, where very wide walls and very, um, very regular, regular architecture. But again, there's ovens and raw materials and a lot of debris in it, which indicates that there's still industrial activity happening. Um, then, to actually then um, show you what is actually coming out of, um, of these different levels, um, quick summary, there is both staple materials, things like textiles and ceramics and food being produced throughout all of these levels. But as we actually get later in time, added to that are a number of elite um, decorative items and objects. So pretty much we have things like textile production indicated by these uh, spindle whorls on this side. Those were found in large numbers throughout all of these levels and indicate that at least wool thread production is happening. Quite probably there's also text, uh, textile weaving happening as well. Uh, there's huge quantities of bitumen 
which is uh, essentially like asphalt and is used for waterproofing and mending things, gluing things together, hafting tools, and a number of things. And that's also found throughout the entire sequence. The ovens indicate some kind of food production. We're still struggling a little bit in trying to figure out what exactly that could be. Bread is the most likely, and that's something which um, is sort of a staple food of Mesopotamia for all time. There could also be roasting meat. There could also be a certain amount of um, processing of grain for brewing, brewing beer, and that as well. Um, other things should be coming. You can't get through a Mesopotamian archaeology lecture without at least a few pictures of ceramics, and there is, in fact, uh, ceramic production going on, both uh, the kind of everyday materials, um, things like this, big plates and jars and so on, and finer wares as well. It's that stuff down there. Um, very fine ware cups with decorative um, motifs on them and so on. And those are both being produced, again, throughout the entire sequence, both fine wares and um, more everyday items. Um, large quantities of stone tools, including huge quantities, I mean, massive, massive, many, many kilos of flint and obsidian for making a variety of tools. Um, also, other more elaborate and decorative kinds of stones, like marble, that's these, uh, red jasper, and there's an interesting sort of yellow brown sort of quartz material as well, and they're making other kinds of objects and inlays out of those. Um, these polished stone axes as well, we find throughout the sequence, and for a while it seemed as if they were actually just coming in um, erratically and so on, but we have a number which are actually in the process of being produced, <coughs> including that dark one right there which is unfinished, so it does look as if they're actually producing these tools in this area as well. Um, it's, yeah. Um, like I said, vast quantities of, of obsidian and flints. And they are both making the tools there and then also using them as well. So we get things like the one in the center, which is a set of flint blades which can actually be fitted back together. So that sort of three strikes on a core produced that. Um, more elaborate things like the uh, arrowheads down here, which look very Neolithic, but in fact are late Calcolithic. And these huge flint saws, which were probably produced in the area and then have been used, in fact, for sawing what we assume is wood. They're very, very blunt and they have striation marks on them from sawing to and fro. Right? Um, these obsidian blades, these ones right here, are in fact actually used for making beads rather than tools, and we'll get to that in uh, possibly the next slide. Um, yeah. So all of that is basically produced throughout the entire sequence. As we get into the later levels with the more significant architecture, we start to get more elite decorative kinds of things, and that includes all the beads at the top, and that one right there is in fact an obsidian bead ground and hacked out of those obsidian blades. We have enormous quantities of these river mollusks as well, and then shell inlay pieces made from them. And again, obsidian discs, ground, um, again, inlay pieces or tokens, we assume. And next one as well as the sort of decorative things, but things which are relatively small scale and not particularly um, informative. There isn't a really strong message. We also find in the latest levels um, some objects that have very, very strong links to power and to the iconography of power. And you'll have to trust me, this is actually one of these objects. It was found in a bin in this level 19 um, structure in the same room that has some grinding stones and jars and so on, it would have been a basic sort of production workshop area. And that kind of blob of stuff there cleans up to this object, which is unique as far as I can tell, even though there are other obsidian vessels found in other sites around. It's in fact an obsidian core which has been used to cut um, blades probably for production of those beads. Then it's been very carefully ground and hollowed out in this part, and the tip of it has been shaped so that it can then be set into this marble base. Um, I know it's not hugely, hugely attractive, but it is incredibly tricky, technologically tricky, to produce this. Obsidian tends to, because it's in volcanic glass, it sort of shatters very, very easily, and to actually grind out the center without breaking the core would have been incredibly difficult to do. Um, there's some other things about this which indicate that there is 
very, very special function. Not only is it a sort of unique, unusual object, it's very small. Um, it, it basically fits sort of in, in your hand. And because the top is actually, the top is quite heavy and the base is very small, it's not something that you ever sort of set down. Right? It would have to be held in the hand of someone all the time. So it is very much associated with one particular individual and it becomes a sort of badge of office. The other thing about it is it's very, very, uh, the volume is very small. It's only about a sort of shot and a half. So it's not something you drink out of if you're thirsty. You drink out of it some kind of special liquid under very, very special kinds of circumstances. The other thing about this, of course, we take, um, I'm, I'm very much one for we're using analogies from later historical periods. And in the third millennium, we have an enormous number of fancy metal cups, things like um, gold cups in the Ur Royal Cemetery and cups that, are, that show up on cylinder seals, which are very much associated with kings and leaders and so on, and then the people sitting and drinking small quantities um, of some exotic liquid out of cups. It's very much something we see in later historical periods, and I'm willing to bring this back as an analogy for, the, for prehistory as well. Um, next one. And that obsidian cup is then complemented by a number of container ceilings with particularly lion imagery on it. And the ceilings themselves, and I've given you an example of how that works in case you've not seen, but I'm sure Oriental Studies or Oriental Institute people, you've probably seen a lot of ceilings in previous lectures. Um, you've got a jar with a kind of cloth cover, strings around, and that would actually be the ceiling with the impression on it. Um, so we usually have both a, a sort of image on the front and then the back will actually retain an impression of what was actually was, was being sealed. We have jar ceilings and a lot of different basket ceilings and box ceilings and so on. And huge numbers of these have, in this particular sequence, have imagery of lions on them. And the symbol and icon of the lion has a long association with kings and with leadership in Mesopotamia, particularly at the end of the Neo-Syrian lion hunts and lion um, imagery. And also, lions show up in Mesopotamian texts as a metaphor for power and a metaphor for um, um, essentially the, 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 the worthy rival of the king. Um, it's basically the only creature which the king, which might oppose the king, um, and yet, in a way, reflects how powerful the king is. Right. Um, we have a lot of Mesopotamian, um, a, a lot of lion imagery in, in the historical periods, and we're also starting to see it back in prehistory as well. And we've got this one, which is basically just kind of walking along in its own. It's quite dramatic and very, very well carved. Uh, but in fact, more interesting is this more difficult one to interpret that turns out to be a lion in a cage. And in my search so far, um, this is essentially unique. And as the lion is a metaphor for power, the caged lion can then be a metaphor for the trapping of that power, the control of that power, control of the wild, control of enemies, control of anything that might be a potential rival for the king. Um, this is our best one that has the sort of mm, little needle-like teeth and a, and a big roaring mouth. We have about... Um, almost a dozen other examples from the site as well, just slightly different versions of the king, of, of the lion in the cage. Um, so, so, so far, basically, our, a summary, quick summary of our excavations in this particular area on the site. We've got elaboration of architecture, increased scale of architecture, and that dovetails nicely with the elaboration of different kinds of items produced in the area. Basics like textiles throughout, show up throughout, but we get these decorative items and these power symbols that show up later on. Um, and what we're working with here is we, we assume that earlier in time, um, early agricultural villages, things like production of pottery, tools, and food would be held within the household, and basically any materials that you want, you would produce on demand. At this point, we already are seeing then these basic goods out, outside of the household and being produced in industrial quantities, presumably still for demand, but also sort of building up a surplus, selling it off, building up a surplus, selling it off. So it's a different whole economic system and a different interaction between, between households and, and producers, let's say. Um, so that's what's happening on the site. And then the second part of our project then deals with the conflict that is happening at the same time. 
and very much conflict in Mesopotamia. It's talked about a lot in terms of Mesopotamian history. Military events are in fact one of the most documented um, events um, in Mesopotamian texts. It's what they seem to, at various times, certainly in the Assyrian period, seem to dwell on military events and military campaigns. But paradoxically, our archeological evidence for warfare and for conflict is vanishingly small. We also have enormous numbers of graves out there, lots and lots of Mesopotamian graves, but particularly in this late Calcolithic period, the fourth millennium, there aren't very many that have been published um, or recorded. So out of this site, Tel Majnuna, we actually have um, some mass graves which fill in a gap and yet are awkwardly different um, than what we assume is the, the tradition of Mesopotamian burials. Um, in terms of, first of all, what we're actually looking at, that is, of course, where we were down here. This Tel Majnuna is one of a ring of smaller sites which surrounds the central site. And for this, I want to briefly show you the settlement landscape that shows. Um, if I hit this again, nothing's going to happen. No. Um, and for this, I, I uh, I would debt to Jason Orr, who's another University of Chicago PhD, and he did a survey of the outer town of Brock, essentially looking at ceramics on the surface and summarizing and, and, and interpreting how the site expanded and contracted over time. And very much this outer town was established at about the, the turn of the fifth to fourth millennium. And the way that it actually began, in fact, was not just a gradual movement outward from the center, but in fact, the center, which was occupied, was there. And individual smaller sites developed in a ring significantly beyond the out outer border of, of, the, of the central mound. Um, these were probably subsidiary villages that would be somehow attached to the central, um, central site. Also poten potentially villas, um, work areas. They don't have to necessarily have been settlements. So that's what's happening around 4,200 or so. By the time we get to, slightly later, the way that the site is, is becoming urbanized is both through intensification of settlement on that ring of sites and also a filling in of the space between. Um, and at this point, by 3,000, actually by about 3,500 BC, the site has reached about 200 hectares, variably densely occupied. And it's in that context that we're looking at Tel Majnuna, the, source, um, the site of these mass burials. There. Um, that should be it. Um, so Tel Majnuna is actually about 500 meters from the main site. Um, and you have to imagine the space between was occupied more or less densely with houses and structures and activity areas and so on. Um, and the, uh, the reason that we, we began excavation out here was in fact there was some modern construction, let's say, various trenches that had to do with the grain storage area that you can see over here. This long trench here um, is actually a modern trench cut by a bulldozer and it was in order to keep rats from getting into the grain storage area. It was filled up with rat poison and so on. Um, but some colleagues of mine went out and, and took a look in the section because archeologists, we love sections and you have to go and look anytime there's a hole in the ground. Uh, and they did find enormous quantities of uh, deposits of human bones along this section. Um, so then the next season we came out and began doing our excavations on this map, which was a little bit of a sort of salvage operation because of this encroachment of modern construction. And over the last two years, we managed to put in 16 trenches and soundings across here because we were in a little bit of a rush. Um, the, uh, you can just see there's a house out here which is owned by the, um, the local, which is the house of the local landowner. And he's been very, very difficult to deal with on a number of levels. And so we needed to sort of rush through this um, to a certain extent. Um, that's why we, we really put an enormous effort into putting a number of trenches across this to get a good picture before something bad happens. Um, this is a uh, shot during excavation, and this, in fact, is the modern trench, which all the blokes are standing in, and then this is one of our excavations, and we have further excavations, actually, up on the site itself. And this is the first of our mass graves, and we do have uh, four of them uh, in our 16 trenches. 
And the first one, which is also the first one we encountered, which is also the earliest in the sequence, has turned out to be the most dramatic. Um, it's so far we've identified about 150 part, parts of 150 dead individuals, let's say, and I'll get into the parts in a minute. Right? Um, we estimate from the excavation that we've done so far and the deposits we can see in the modern trench that this deposit is probably about 20 meters long and between two to three meters wide. It's not completely solidly piles of bones. There are sort of clusters that are very, very dense and clusters or areas which are a bit more sparse. But roughly, we're estimating there has to be at least 400 or potentially more dead individuals in this particular deposit right here. We've got some um, dating, which is from ceramic, um, ceramic typology, uh, which is pretty, pretty safely dates us to about 3,800 BC. So that is roughly overlapping with the, the levels of excavation on the site, which show this elaboration and power iconography and so on. Um, so the interpretation of this, we have at least 150, maybe as many as 400 different individuals out here. Um, they are all young adults, so between the ages of about 14 and 40, which is not the, the part of the population that should be dying. Uh, if you have a natural die-off, it should be very, very young children and people who are older than 40. So this is a, sort of the, the part of the population which should be very, very healthy. They are, in fact, both genders, uh, both male and female, and about a sort of 60, 40, 60 men, 40, 40 percent women. Um, and the, 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 this relatively young age certainly indicates that there is something wrong. <laughs> right? um, it, we thought about potentially there being a disease, um, sort of plague, some kind of, of disease, illness issues. But again, that should carry off the very young and the very old. Violence seems the, the most plausible explanation for all of this. Um, and in fact, mass graves in general are simply non-normative for Mesopotamian burial traditions. If we have burials, they tend to be individual or at most kind of double burials, or if there are uh, group burials, they've been accumulated over time. These things all seem to be, have died at the same time, these people died at the same time, um, and have bar been buried at the same time. Um, the other thing about them is that there is, there's significant disarticulations here. They can look a little bit chaotic. So in this group you have actually sort of four heads and a leg and up in this part right here is more or less an articulated torso between the sort of neck and uh, sort of the part where your ribs stop, right? Um, it can look as if, quite chaotic and it can look as if there is sort of a slightly random, random look to it. But as we got sort of more and more um, larger samples of what was going on, this is another cluster, it's pretty clear that things like the single elements that we have, which tend to be heads essentially, are things that drop off very, very early in our sequence of decomposition. There's a very um, organized way in which humans decompose as we die, and basically you, you fall apart from the top down, so your head drops off very, very easily. Uh, your shoulders also uh, separate very, very early on. As anyone who's ever separated, um, dislocated your shoulder, you'll know that that's a very, very easy joint and it falls off very quickly. So what we're seeing here is actually not particularly chaotic. Uh, if you look at the, the things which remain articulated, the parts which remain articulated, and the parts which are separate, um, it's pretty clear these people did actually die at the same time and have disarticulated in the same sequence. <laughs> right. um, we do have a question of how long that actually took. And it's pretty clear from things like there's some rat damage and some potential um, bird of prey damage, little gnaw marks and hack marks on some of these bones, that after death, all of these people were actually exposed for a significant length of time for carnivores to come and scavenge and so on. It's at least a couple of weeks, or potentially as long as a couple of months, and this is very much depends on what season this event actually happened. So if it's in the summer, a couple of weeks. If it's in the winter, it could be a couple of months. And we haven't actually determined that, the precise season yet. Then what's happened is they've actually been shifted, which, which is actually probably when most of the disarticulation took place. And, um, well, we'll get into that in a minute. There's also, at the same time, another complicated event happening. And you can see in both of these images, as well as human bones, there's significant quantities of animal bones as well. So there's a whole 
down there, a kind of side of beef. Um, there's also some other large articulated cattle bones there. And in this stack of bones right here, um, there's actually an interleaving of human and animal bones. So at the top, there's actually various human bits, including there's an arm right here, spine, couple of heads. This then is actually the scapula of a cow, but it's overlapping um, a whole additional set of human bones down below. We're assuming from things like quite elaborate uh, and distinctive butchering marks on the cattle bones that there is, has been a very, very, um, a, a, a very precise event and essentially a feast uh, which took place probably after the death, but before the actual shifting of bodies from the battlefield to this area. Right. Again, what we're looking at is potentially, is this a commemoration of sort of our dead, or is this a celebration of, the, of enemy dead? And we'll get back to that in a minute. But there has been a feast which has taken place probably on the battlefield, strangely and paradoxically sort of above these decomposing bodies, and then the whole lot has been scooped up and shifted over here. The um, bones also, they're not in an actual pit, they're sort of piled up in a long sort of berm as well, which, and were probably again left exposed once they were laid out there as well. All of this is kind of, again, non-normative, and there's a certain amount of corpse abuse, you might say, which leads us to believe that this is actually probably enemy dead rather than our, you know, our friends. Um, some other things too, we can see a certain amount of how, a certain amount of information we can gather of how these corpses were actually transported as well. This is, I have to admit, my favorite image because I'm quite ghoulish, but uh, you can see in here, there's at least two individuals who are more or less actually still intact from about the sort of shoulder, about here, all the way down. Um, that's spine right through there, rib cage, the pelvis is here, and the legs are actually here and here. Unfortunately, they've been chopped off by the bulldozer. And there's another which is in exactly the state of, same state of preservation right here. Um, probably what's happened is, is um, my reconstruction of the transport of this is dead bodies lying actually still relatively articulated on the battlefield, but they have started to, in fact, decompose and fall apart. And if I had to transport a dead body, um, right, you sort of make a stretcher, but in order to pick them up and shift them onto the stretcher, you probably pick them up by the wrists and the ankles. And what's happened is for both of these two individuals is when they've lifted up the wrists, the head has fallen back and fallen off, and then the arms have also snapped off of the body as well. Right. The legs and everything sort of from there down has remained intact, and so that's actually been sort of put on a stretcher and then shuffled along over here. And what they've done is actually, in this case, slung the head on top as well as so a way to, to move it along. Um, so anyway, this sort of gives us a, well, the human side to the whole cleanup operation as well in this, in this image. Um, so anyway, this also um, is, this, this image also gives you a, a, an indication again of non-normative, of unusual sort of corpse abuse type practices because there isn't really a sense that they're trying to keep the individual body separate. Now if you have to create a mass grave for your own dead, you tend to actually keep the bodies more or less together. You try to, even if the body falls apart, you try to scoop it up more or less together and keep it intact, even if you have to put it in a mass grave. But in fact, things like this leg does not belong to that individual because his or her legs are actually still intact. So there is this mingling of bodies and there's really no attempt to keep the, the individual's identity separate from each other. Again, that's making us think this is enemies rather than friends. So that was basically the first mass grave, about 400 people, about 3,800 BC. Then in the process of excavating across this site, we were actually digging in this trench right here to reconstruct the stratigraphic sequence of what was happening on the mound to sort of get some pottery and some dating um, evidence and so on. And we found at the bottom of a sort of four and a half, five meter deep sounding evidence for a second mass grave or mass burial event. In this one, we only were actually able to identify 12 people, and that's their heads right there. Um, we don't really know the extent of this particular pile of bodies. There's also a torso up here and an arm or something down here. We're assuming, again, there could be, well, there's at least 12. This could be as large, again, as another several hundred. And the ceramic indicators for this indicate it's about 100 years after our first one. 
So we have two major conflict events in mass graves across this 100 year span. Um, then, just to make our lives complete, we found a third violent event, just a little bit further along, um, which dates to about 100 years later. Now, at first glance, this looks like a sort of normal cemetery. You look at it, you think, thank goodness, the bodies are still articulated. Um, there's not a sort of mass grave. There's no, you know, no real problems here. Um, the individual bodies are laid, um, are laid in with, sort of res with respect to each other, and there's some attempt to keep them separate from each other. But the closer we looked at this, it's clear that this is another violent event, um, aftermath. Again, the ages are too young. They're between 14 and 40, so they haven't experienced a, a normal death. And in fact, they're high, the bodies are highly weathered and often slightly mingled in with each other. So our reconstruction of what's going on here, yet another battle, um, yet another sequence of dead people. But they've gathered them up relatively quickly. Instead of leaving them on the battlefield to be gnawed by rats and to fall apart out there, they've actually been shifted relatively quickly. But they've been sort of slung down in the dirt um, quite casually. And the key thing is they were not actually covered over. They weren't actually put in, in pits and they were not actually covered over particularly well. There might have been a little bit of dust sort of slung over the top of them, but then that washed away. And in fact, the bones are highly weathered through exposure, but exposure in situ. We have at least 32 individuals here in this event, and again, we couldn't actually, we didn't get to the edges of the cemetery on all sides. This is probably a smaller number of people um, than in the other mass graves, but at least maybe a few dozen more, maybe as many as 50 or possibly even 100, but again, we didn't get the full extent of this, but another, another event. So now we have three events across 300 years. Um, and then we'll actually jump, oh, Sorry, I'm jumping ahead, <laughs> right? In terms of evidence of violence as well, as well as, I mean, we had sort of slightly second, uh, secondary evidence for, for the violence up until now, things like the, the, um, the age range um, and, and, and so on. We were actually looking more carefully um, this last season for particular sort of evidence on the bones of violence. Unfortunately, they seem to be using mostly sort of percussive weapons, things like maces and even wooden sticks or something. So there's not a lot of kind of slash marks from metal weapons. I'm saying unfortunately, but maybe it is fortunate. But, but what we do have are things like um, this character right here whose face is essentially gone, probably through the swipe of a mace. Um, this one, probably the damage to the skull is probably actually secondary. But the key thing about that individual is he actually retains the atlas ver vertebra, which is this right here, which is the first vertebra in your spine. Normally, um, when your head falls off, when our heads fall off, that atlas vertebra should stay attached to your spine, not attached to your head, right? Um, but if your head is cut off, it tends to, you tend to take the atlas vertebra with you. <laughs> So this is, but there's potential evidence here for um, the actual sort of head being cut off. And the, the, probably the most interesting thing that we have out there is this guy here who has this sort of healed dent in his head from, again, some previous battle which he survived. It's kind of more or less healed and then he's got it in the second or the second or the third time he was in the, in the battle. Um, so we do actually have some evidence out here of, um, of actual sort of violent injuries as well and potential causes of death. Um, then, so we have these three violent events. And then we have yet another mass grave, making our fourth mass grave. And this one is actually roughly contemporary with the first one that I talked about and is actually quite near to it. Um, down there, so about the same date and only for about 10 meters away. And this one again, it's, it, it looks quite chaotic, but it's turned out to be the most interesting of all of these deposits for a slightly gruesome, um, slightly gruesome reason. And again, you can see it's a, 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 well, you can't see, but it's a long, narrow pile of body parts, smaller than the other in that it's only about a meter wide and about seven meters long. We have identified, again, parts of at least 60 individuals. It's likely there is actually probably at least twice that number, maybe as many as 150 parts of, or parts of at least 150 people in here, <laughs> let's say. Um, the interesting thing about this is there's actually, the, the body elements we have have been highly selected. So probably the source of this is essentially a tertiary deposit, and the source of these bodies is yet another mass grave. So we have an event, 
a shifting of bodies to one area, and then from that pile, they've selected a number of elements that they've shifted to a, a third pile, <laughs> let's say. Um, the elements here are heads, but particular parts of our heads, which I'll show you in a minute. Spines, for some reason, but primarily the long bones of the arms, and particularly the legs, the femur, which is your thigh bone, uh, are the most common elements within this group. And the key thing about these, the bones is that a lot of the femurs, the thigh bones, have been made into tools. Uh, so there, you can see in these, they're, they're very rough tools, I'd say, but the shafts have often been polished, basically, from handling. They've been cut flat on one end, and then they're pointed on the other. And essentially, this is all the, the sort of flat ends. And in some of these, they've actually been cut and then sort of chipped into shape. Then the opposite end is sort of roughly pointed. Then the pointed part has actually been further polished by use for something. And after I put this slide together, I realized that they actually fall out into about two very distinct sizes. There's some that are about 20 centimeters long, and some that are about 10 to 12 centimeters long. I haven't quite worked out what that might mean, but anyway, we have sort of larger tools and smaller tools out here. Um, and a slightly closer version of these, you can see the polish on the, on the shaft on this one, and the polish on the points of these. Then the other thing is that I did say that there were heads out here as well, and they tend to be relatively small chunks like this. We don't have the entire skull. What we tend to have is the, the frontal part of the head, so the part that's essentially sort of from your brow ridge up to the center, right, where um, we have a suture right here. And not very, the lower jaws are virtually absent and very, very little of the kind of face or the back of the, of the skull. And the heads are also slightly polished. I hope you can see on here, there's a sort of reflective shine right there where there's been polished from handling. And there's also some abrasions on here as well, some very, very light striations and abrasions. Right. Now, a lot of this kind of um, traces on bones very much fits with recognized archaeological signatures for cannibalism. Right. Um, in Mesopotamia, in art, in text, in archaeology, cannibalism is essentially unknown. But this is the kind of thing that you wouldn't really expect to see written down. Um, and just because it's rare or unique doesn't mean it didn't actually happen. Um, the one problem that we have here is what exactly are they eating, what parts, and how would that actually work. Um, what we're assuming probably happened is the reason that the heads are getting this sort of abrasion and then and polish and abrasion is they've actually um, sort of turned the head over, <laughs> right? And in order to sort of separate the sutures, kind of smacked it lightly on some solid surface so that then the sutures then separate from each other. A bit like if you ever worked in the restaurant industry, how you break apart an iceberg lettuce, you sort of smack it on something and the stem comes out. So anyway, you can do the same kind of thing apparently with a head, smack it lightly, and the sutures kind of fall apart, <laughs> right? And then you're left with the brain exposed, and then they're sort of doing something potentially with the leg tools, the pointed leg tools, and the brain that is sort of balanced on the inside of the frontal lobe. The one problem with this, of course, is that these bodies would have had to have been significantly decayed in order for this process to take place. And I really can't imagine, I have a pretty gruesome and elaborate imagination, but I really cannot imagine gagging down a uh, brain that has been desiccated, um, decomposing for some weeks. <laughs> so that's where the kind of potential for cannibalism seems to stop. But it's certainly, if it isn't cannibalism, that is also significant corpse abuse, um, simply opening up heads, and even if they're just kind of washing around in there. Um, this, again, is looking like enemies. Um, well, <laughs> you get the picture, right? Um, so anyway, that's that's interesting, very, very gruesome. Sorry, you guys had dinner. <laughs> um, um, our other mass grave. So anyway, at least four conflict events across this, um, this 200 years, and significant, uh, unusual, non-normative behavior is happening out here. Um, that's the end of the graves. But then just to be, you know, to sort of, to, to complete what's happening on this mound. What happens after um, each one of these graves is there's a significant and very, very rapid deposition of rubbish over the top of them. It very much looks as if once they've actually created these piles of bodies, that then they're actually building up a sort of burial mound over the top of them. Um, above those first two mass graves, we have about five meters worth of rubbish, which is 
simply industrial quantities of flint and obsidian and other kinds of raw materials, huge quantities of ceramics. I've estimated there's about 600,000 shards that we've processed in the last two years alone, and that's a tiny percentage of what would actually be out there. And simply kind of ash and soil and just dirt piled over the top. So they're very much making a monument on top of these mass graves as well. Within that, then, um, the, there's a very distinctive set of ceramics, and we do have a pretty decent typology, so we know um, what, roughly what time we're at. Very much the ceramics, again, seem to indicate feasting kinds of processes. They're very much um, things like these single, the single serving bowls at the top and the larger sort of um, serving vessels at the bottom. And very much they look as if they're sort of single use uh, and then have been deliberately snapped in half. So there's no real wear traces on them and they're not chipped particularly or anything. So they very much look as if there's been a feast um, that is a sort of subsequent to um, the actual feast where they're feasting over the bodies. They brought the bodies over and then they have like another one as they're throwing in the rubbish over the top. And that includes these bowls that they then use once and snap in half and that's it and they're throwing them away. Which helps build up the deposit but also um, just is a, a sort of closure deposit over the top. Um, Part of the reason that we can tell that the, that the rubbish builds up very, very rapidly is also because we have vast quantities of container ceilings in this deposit as well. These two ceilings on the right are created with the same stamp, and I'm hoping you can see it's a sort of, it's a square seal that has two rows of little goats going in two different directions. The clay is exactly the same, the degree of wear on the seal is exactly the same, and it's likely that they were actually produced within seconds of each other, if not minutes of each other, attached to some container. The container has been shifted to Brock, opened up, and then these two ceilings would have been deposited, you know, deposited in rubbish essentially instantaneously. They're then separated in terms of where they ended up in the stratigraphy by about a meter of deposit. And we tend to think a meter, that would take some decades potentially to build up, but it's likely that built up within the space of an hour of, of significant dumping. So this five meters of deposit we have um, is actually not that significant in time, even though it's significant in, in height. Um, the other great thing about um, this rubbish deposit is we now have about a thousand ceilings from this entire mount. And they have an, unusual, an unusually high number of unique uh, impressions on them. The number of seal ceilings that we have that have the same impression, impression of the same seal, is incredibly small. So we have about 900 different impressions out there, which again indicates probably the bringing in of um, probably food for, the, for feasts, um, other kinds of materials into Brock and that feeds into our ideas of economic elaboration and control and so on. Um, I'll quickly show you some of the more dramatic ones. Most of the ones we have are this kind of theme where you have lions attacking gazelles and deer and so on. Um, different actual seals but the same kind of motif over and over and over. Um, we also have a significant number of um, human and humanoid figures, including this guy right here, who also shows up um, on sites across everywhere from North Iraq all the way up into Anatolia. Um, I hope you can see there's a sort of horn on the back and a pointed hat. He's got a little tiny wispy beard and a sort of feathered outfit and very high pointed shoes at the bottom. Um, and we've got other sort of hybrid figures, goat men, um, and, and so on. So a whole a very, very interesting range of, of, of different motifs. And among these also, we get back to this idea of the iconography of power and the interaction of humans and lions. Right? Um, this is, we have several impressions of this particular seal, which is, well, should be very, very clear. Um, human figure stabbing a lion with a quite long spear, uh, and there's even a sort of, this blob right here is a probably blood gushing out of the lion as well, just to keep in the gruesome kind of theme that we have going on. Um, the interesting thing about this is the very, very clear iconography of, of, of lion-human combat. And again, we have this right through Mesopotamian art culminating in the Neo-Syrian lion hunt reliefs. 
And up until this point, very much the sort of one of the earliest um, versions of this icon has been this object right here, which comes from Uruk in southern Iraq, and is dated to about 3100 BC. And that's long acknowledged as essentially the first version we have of this lion king um, hand to hand combat. We've now pushed this iconography back by about 700 or 800 years and shifted its origin essentially from southern Iraq, from southern Mesopotamia up to northern Mesopotamia. And again, very much we're dealing with themes of um, the, the lion being the equal and the rival of the king and, and, and issues of power and so on. Now this one, which is very, very clear, but also is supplemented by this next one, which is more more difficult to see, but is actually probably much more important. Right? And the key things about this, there are a number of things, and one is that there is actually a landscape and a background to this scene, which again is almost unique at this time period. Very much you tend to see single figures in a sort of blank, um, blank background. And here we've got a sort of uh, tree on a mountain that's um, that right there, you can see it better in the in the composite drawing, with a gazelle or a deer sort of leaping up against the leaping up the mountain against the tree, and it's actually being attacked by a vulture at the top as well. But then below it is actually the primary scene of again lion and this sort of paradoxically scrawny looking human, um, but it could actually be an error of, of how the seal is actually pressed down. And they are actually in very, very close hand-to-hand -hand combat and the, the, the male human figure is, you can see here, you can actually see much better here, it's actually stabbing the lion with a, a very long bladed dagger. The dagger is clearest here, right? Unfortunately, the guy is clearest here, but that's the, the composite view of this. So again, it's not, um, we have this imagery, and we don't simply just have one example of it. We have the same human lion combat in a variety of different, um, oh, different versions of, of the scene. Um, right. So, that's actually about it. Um, that's very much um, what we've been looking at um, at Tel Brock in the last couple of years. So we have um, essentially the results are this new iconography, well, not new iconography of leadership, but earlier iconography of leadership than has previously been, been uh, reconstructed, longer history than we imagined. Um, we've got a new appreciation of the whole economic and industrial side of urban growth and proof that in fact at the same time we're having this urban expansion and more complicated looking um, iconography of leadership, that there is also significant conflict going on. We still admittedly, even though we've sort of identified the mass graves as those of enemies, we're still not entirely sure whether those are in fact are basically our local enemies, if this is actually the result of internal sort of class warfare, conflict within the site itself, or whether the expansion of Brock and the obviously very, very elaborate and rich materials there have made Brock into a target for some kind of outside enemy. Um, so we're still working on that and working on the interpretation of that um, in, in future seasons. So thank you very much. Um, and I can take any questions if that's, if that's normal. And also I'd like to say thanks to um, the Department of Antiquities, the whole, the, the best team working in Syria. Uh, the Telgrog team, and we do have a bit more information on the website as well, um, though it's, it's out of date as soon as you put it up, but there's a bit more um, information on our website as well. So, thank you.